We've all done it. You've done it. I've done it. Some of us like to talk about it. Others don't. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. The Hello World application. So, today we're going to build a Hello World application in Lambda. It's a great place to get started that's going to give us a launch pad into looking at CloudWatch. And then we'll be able to get into some of the other configurations that you can have for a function, such as controlling its memory or the amount of execution time that it's allowed to have. Let's go ahead and jump in and get started on this one. Okay, so before we can build our Hello World applications, first thing first, go ahead and log into your AWS Management Console. From here, we'll go ahead and navigate to Lambda. If you pinned it earlier, you can use the button up here on the top, or you can find it through this Lambda or the service search place. If you pinned it earlier, you can find it here on the top, or you can always search for it in the search box. So let's go to Lambda, and the first time you're here, you may notice this page. If you've created a function or been playing with it a little bit, it should look a little bit different, but don't worry about it. So let's go ahead and click over here on the left on this uh, little triple bar icon, and this is gonna show you the various sections of Lambda. For now, we're just gonna look at one thing, which is the functions section. When you create a function, there are several ways you can create them. You can author them from scratch, or use other blueprints or existing application repositories to build your application out. For this example, we would actually wanna just start with author from scratch, and it will actually create a hello world example for us. We'll modify it, and we're gonna go check out some other functionality around it, but we'll go ahead and start by calling this hello world. Under the runtime menu, you'll find a number of options. Lambda supports by default many different languages. In our case, we want to use Node.js 8.1. If you're viewing this after the course has been created and the version numbers are a little bit different, just make sure you pick something from the Node.js 8x family and you should be able to continue along with this course, no problem. So we'll go ahead and select that for now. The next thing it wants from us is to understand its security. So without going too deep for now, you have to create a role for the function to execute under, and you give that role permissions. So for now, we're just going to let it create the role for us. So we will just call this hello world role. Note that your first function can take a little while to create. This is completely normal. Congratulations, you've created your first function. But let's dive in a little bit deeper and see what's lying underneath the hood. Here near the top, you're going to find a lot of different buttons that do things. We're going to focus on the test and the save button for now, and we'll go ahead and ignore these other guys. Same thing with the configuration and monitoring. You can create a lot of different functionalities for Lambda functions by setting up triggers here in this top layer and this helps you get a visualization of the security permissions that you have. In our case, the only thing we did was create the default role. So the default role in Lambda will give us access to Amazon's CloudWatch logs. This allows our application to write logs that we can then later look at and help us debug production and development problems. Congratulations, you've created your first function. Now let's take a look at what's going on here on the screen. We're not going to dive into everything, but we will take a look at a few of these buttons and I will kind of give you a high level overview of the various sections of functionality here. As we go through this course, we'll definitely be diving into a lot more of this. For now, we're only going to focus on this test and save button. Save obviously will chain save our changes when we make them, and test will run an automated test on the code that we're running. So we'll come back to that in just a second. Next is this designer layer. The designer layer allows you to set up triggers that will set off this function, and we're not gonna use any of those for now, and gives you a visual representation of the security permissions that you have based on your role. So over here, we only have access to Amazon CloudWatch logs. This will allow us to write with the console.log command logs that we can then later check on 
So if there was a problem in production or development, we would be able to get more detailed information about it. Let's go ahead and scroll down a little bit and we'll look at the function code. So this is what they refer to as the Cloud9 IDE. The Cloud9 IDE is a very basic IDE that you can use inside of your browser to edit the code. This is very useful for making small changes and adding console statements even in large code bases. For now, we're going to stick to using this until later when we set up our offline development environment. Okay, so let's take a little bit of a look at what's going on here with the code. Over here, you'll notice index.js was automatically created for us. Each function will have an index.js, and this is where your code will start to execute from based on this handler box. We'll worry about this box a little bit later. So for now, this is the code that's running, and this function simply returns a JOSN object and that JOSN object will be returned to any agent that is invoking this function. For instance, if we invoked this via a web endpoint, this would be the JOSN packet that is responded to through the web endpoint. And if we call it through, say, the AWS SDK or command line, this information would be returned to that invoking agent. In our case, we'll go ahead and just leave this function as is and we're going to scroll up to the top and click the test button for the first time. The very first time you click the test button, you'll be presented with the test configuration creation event page. And this is used to create tests that you can reuse. Oftentimes when we're creating a function, we'll want to pass in parameters to tell the function how we want it to act. In our case, I'm going to go ahead and delete all of this and just leave a blank JOSN object in there. And I will call our event hello world test. I'm going to go ahead and click create. And you'll notice that this created the hello world test inside of this drop down. So I'll go ahead and make sure that guy is selected. And I'm going to click the test button. This actually runs our function for the very first time, and if I look under these details, you'll notice that the Jocelyn object from below has actually been returned as the result from our function. There's a lot of other things going on in this screen, such as the duration of the function, how much memory was used, what the maximum configurated resources were, and some other things. But the most important thing to look at right now is that there was a response and that you controlled the response from the code down here. And it said hello from Lambda and gave us a status code of 200. After you've created your test, you'll notice that the test appears here in the test dropdown list. This is useful if you have several scenarios under which your function will use and you want to set up multiple tests. So now that we've created our first test, I'm going to go ahead and run it and click test here. The test actually runs directly inside of your Lambda editor. So here we already have the execution results for our function and a summary of some of the metadata that went on. How long did the function take to run? How long were we billed for? The amount of memory it was configured for and the actual memory that it used. Some of this will be very useful later in tuning your functions. For now, we're going to kind of skip by it all. And the last thing we want to look at is this log output. Notice that it's pretty much just got a bunch of codes and some of the same information that we looked at above here in the summary. Now, notice that the Save button is highlighted. I'm going to go ahead and click the Test button once without clicking the Save button. And we'll notice that we get roughly the same results from the test that we got before and that there's no new log output down here. So it's very important that you click the save button before running new tests. So now when I run the test, you'll notice that our console.log statement has actually produced additional logging. Everything else looks pretty much the same though. Now before we move on from logging, I want to show you one more thing. Logs are stored long term in CloudWatch. So there's a link up here that will take us directly to that. So I'm going to go ahead and control click on that to open it up in a new tab. 
And in here, you'll notice that we have log streams. Log streams relate to a specific version of the function. Since we've created two versions of this function, we see two different log streams, and we can actually see the time that the log stream was last affected. In this case, I want to click on the latest one, and you'll notice that this log output is the same log output from when we ran the function using the test button. This is very useful when you're running Lambda functions from places that aren't the test button, such as the CLI from another language, or even as the result of an event occurring on the AWS event bus. We'll get more into that later, but this is an excellent place to go review the execution of your functions after the fact. In fact, CloudWatch is so useful that I'm going to take the time to pin it to my top bar right now. Go ahead and drag to the top and pin it. All right, now let's go ahead and close out our CloudWatch and come back to Lambda and take a last look at the things that we haven't looked at so far. So here we have our code. We've gone through that a little bit. We're gonna be diving in a lot more here. Below, there are several sections that are very important to us, but we won't be using right off the get-go. First, environment variables. These are very useful for telling your function about global variables that you would like to know. For instance, you might list the name of a bucket that you want it to read details from for configuration. Moving down, tags are an excellent way to leave information for yourself and for other members of your team. For instance, you might tag a series of functions as production ready or development ready by adding various different key and value pairs. Execution roles have to do with IAM and the security permissions that your function has while it is executing. We used in this function the default creation which only allows access to CloudWatch logs. We'll be jumping into this more as we need to access other services on AWS. The basic settings panel is used to give your function a description, limit the amount of memory that it has access to, and provide a timeout so that it doesn't run past any expectations. By default, the values are very small, providing only 128 megabytes of RAM and a three second execution window. For our needs right now, this is plenty. The next section to take a look at is the network section. We're not going to be using this right now. However, down the road, if you are creating a function that needs to access resources inside of a virtual private cloud or VPC, this is where you would allow the function to be inside of the VPC. Later when we're creating resources with the AWS SDK, we will add our functions to our VPC. For now, we're gonna select no VPC. Next up is the debugging and error handling section. This allows you to configure where your dead queue letters go. Dead queue letters are the result of failed function executions, either from timeouts or retries being ensanguinated. When a dead queue letter is created, it's delivered to one of two locations. In this case, we can deliver it to an SNS endpoint, or topic as they're called, or an SQS queue. SNS stands for Send Notification Service, and SQS stands for Send Queue Service. We'll dive into these more when we want to start talking about this, but for now, we're going to leave this box alone. Going down to our last two boxes, next up and almost to the end is our concurrency box. The concurrency box allows us to control the amount of simultaneous functions that are executing with this code. In some cases, it may be desirable to only have one or two concurrent executions of a single function going. And in other cases, you may want to consider a nearly unlimited capacity. Last up is the auditing and compliance section. This is very useful if you work for a company that has strict rules that they need to follow and provide auditing and compliance information with it. This is used with the Cloud Trail console, and we'll get into this later. So our first function's done. 
and it was a basic one, but it gave us some understanding of how logging works and how to create and start coding our first function. We're going to be building more complex examples from this point forward, and in the next chapter we're going to start integrating with other services such as S3. We're also going to learn how to configure the security of our function so that it acts correctly. And to top it all off, you survived my bad joke from the intro. So you're still here, and we're good to go. Let's get moving to the next chapter.